Today's scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 through 46, New Revised Standard Version. Please rise as you are able, in body or in spirit, and listen now for the word of God. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you as a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Would you pray with me and for me? Not I, but through Christ in me. So may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of every heart in this moment be pleasing to you, God. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we continue this morning with our worship series, Roots and Fruits, our United Methodist heritage and future in which we are digging into our roots as Wesleyan United Methodists and also seeking to discover how can that rootedness then bear fruit in our lives, through our community of faith, in this world that is hurting and broken and lost. Part of what we are doing is we're trying to answer the question, why be United Methodist? Why choose to be United Methodist, especially in a time and in a city that is increasingly diverse, both ethnically and in in terms of religious expression. And we live in a time when many people are choosing to have no religious expression at all. So why, why United Methodist? Uh, part of what we've been wanting to do is hear from people within the First United Methodist Church family uh, to answer that question. We've heard from a variety of people. um, And this morning, we're going to hear from Ryan Carter. Ryan is one of our newer members. Ryan found his way to First United Methodist Church of Allen last fall when he moved to the area for his work. He moved here from Oklahoma. Um, And Ryan very quickly found his way um, into the choir. He sings in the chancel choir during the traditional service. We are so grateful for his 
his tenor when he is here. He's also found his way into friendships with uh, people in this congregation that are, I think, life-giving on both sides of that. And so um, he has kind of a different perspective um, than folks who've been here at First Allen for a long time. Um, and he talked about that in his conversation with Adam earlier this week. We're going to hear some of how he answered those two questions. How, how did you become United Methodist and why are you still United Methodist? So let's um, see what he had to say. I was born into a family of United Methodists, so born and raised as a, as a child in the church, um, was very active, my family was very active in the church, my grandpa was a Sunday school teacher, um, and I was really kind of given the benefit of being born into a family that was United Methodist, um, and so from the get-go I was a part of that, that church. The United Methodist Church has always been very welcoming and caring for, for me as a kid and for um, my family as a whole. It has always felt that everyone was watching me grow up and I was getting to be a part of a larger family, not just in my, my immediate blood family, but uh, the larger body of, of church. So I, uh, like I said, I was born and raised United Methodist, uh, left the church around college to explore some other denominations um, within Christianity, uh, and then actually found myself coming back to United Methodist uh, with my grandpa's passing. Um, it connected me back to the church of remembering why I, I fell in love with the church to begin with, seeing his, um, his church family gather around us after his passing, um, feeling that community, that, that grace, that love, um, really reminded me why I, I loved the church to begin with and why I could be my true self at, uh, at church and within the First United Methodist community. And on the day I walked in, um, I saw the choir in their robes, the, the youth group was singing um, Godspell music, and there was just a lot of signs that reminded me of what I loved and um, I felt welcomed wholeheartedly. Um, met members and I didn't feel overwhelmed by their, their love or their, um, their welcomingness. I felt accepted and um, wanted. Ryan, um, and, and when you watch the whole conversation, you, you really get this, that, that what has drawn him to the United Methodist Church over and over again is family. Um, and, and that was sort of thematic um, in all the conversations that we've had with folks, um, this, this sense that this is a place where I find family. Um, and, and, and we are a family who, who um, come together out of our, our, our shared love for God and for Jesus. And, and this aspect of who we are, this is something we very much hold in common with every other Christian denomination. Um, because those, every Christian denomination is formed around our love for God and our love for Jesus and our desire to be more Christ-like. You find that in every Christian denomination. Now, for Wesleyan United Methodists, we understand this to be the path of holiness. Um, and, and we understand that, that, that becoming more Christ-like happens kind of with t in two ways. Uh, it, as, as we seek um, to grow in our personal holiness and in our social holiness. Now, personal holiness is, is how we grow in our personal relationship with God. And that's solitary work. That's, that's um, having um, a, an, a, an active prayer life. We are actively in conversation with God and listening to God. It's actively studying and listening to Scripture. It is listening to God. It might mean fasting. Uh, they are um, uh, practices that draw us closer to God, a personal relationship with God. Um, and that, that really is oftentimes work that we do alone. But for John Wesley, the father of Methodism, he would say it isn't just about personal holiness, it's also social holiness. In fact, John Wesley has said that there is no such thing as solitary holiness, because we were created in the image of God, and God is a social God. God has created us to 
be in God's image. God has created us for the purpose of relationship with God, but with others. And, and so, um, our, the depth of our love for God, Wesley would say, the depth of our love for God is revealed by the way we love those whom God loves. The depth of our love for God is revealed by the way we love those whom God loves. And that is very much supported by that teaching of Jesus that's found in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the teaching about the two greatest commandments. And so I want to remind us about that, looking at how Matthew says this teaching happened in the 22nd chapter of Matthew, beginning at verse 34. There's been this whole lot of back and forth between Jesus and the religious authorities. And when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which, command, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And I think it's important to note here that there's not an either or. You do either one or the other. It's both and. Loving God, loving neighbor. I, I was reminded of this this week when I, um, I, I receive a daily um, email from the Center for Action and Contemplation. Uh, this is a center that was established in the late 80s by Franciscan friar, Father Richard Rohr. And um, he founded the Center for Action and Contemplation because this is what he says. He saw a deep need for the integration of both action and contemplation. The two are inseparable. Father Richard likes to say the most important word in the center's name is neither action nor contemplation, but the word and contemplation is a way of listening with the heart while not relying entirely on the head contemplation is a prayerful letting go of our sense of control and choosing cooperation with god and god's work in the world prayer without action father richard says can promote our tendency to self-preoccupation prayer without action can promote our tendency to self-preoccupation. And without contemplation, even well-intended actions can cause more harm than good. We need them both. We need prayer and we need action. You can't have one without the other. And when we are aligned with God, when we are loving God with all that we have, then God tells us and moves us to action. And that's part of what we see in the parable that Dana read to us from the Gospel of Matthew today. This parable is Jesus' um, last teaching in the gospel of Matthew. His teaching begins in chapter 5 with the Beatitudes and it culminates here in chapter 25. And this teaching happens right before Jesus begins the walk toward the cross. And this teaching, this parable, sometimes called the parable of the judgment of the nation, sometimes called a parable of the sheep and the goats. It's a parable that he gives to the disciples after they've asked um, these very anxious questions. They're very anxious about how Jesus is making noise like he's leaving them. They're anxious and asking, when, when will we see you return? When will be the end of the age? How will we recognize you? And he offers them this whole series of parables about this and ends with this one. And there's good news in this for anyone who's anxious about this because the good news is you do not have to wait to the end of the age to see and recognize Jesus because Jesus is with us right here right now in places they normally would not expect to see Jesus. 
Uh, This parable is an illustration of one of the primary themes of the Gospel of Matthew, the theme of Emmanuel, God is with us. It starts at the very beginning of Matthew when Joseph is told this is how he is to name the child, Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And then it comes back in again uh, very overtly at the end of the Gospel in the 28th chapter when Jesus says to the disciples, the risen Jesus says to them, I will be with you until the end of the age. And here in this parable, Jesus is saying, this is where I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you in those who are hungry and those who are thirsty and those who are sick and in prison, those who need clothing, those who are poor, anybody who's been pushed aside, who's not seen, who is grieving and lost and lonely, that's where you will find me, in those places. Now, the parable can be a little bit threatening because of the second half of it. I was listening to it and I was thinking, oh, should we have read this part? Uh, because it is a little bit threatening and it seems to go against what we talked about just a few weeks ago, that we are saved by grace through faith. We are not saved by our works. We are not saved because we go and we care for the needs of others. We are saved by grace through faith. But I also want to remind us that we read a few weeks ago from the letter of James, faith without works is dead. It's both and. And these, that went to those who were hungry and thirsty and and sick and in prison, they are those who are aligned with God, who are loving God with heart and soul and mind and strength. And because we are loving God with all that we have, then we must, we we can't resist going out and meeting the needs of those who are hungry and thirsty and lost and lonely and grieving and sad and broken. We are moving toward the needs of this world. Now I know When I look at what's going on in the world, the need is just so huge. It it sometimes is beyond my capacity to just even take it in. And this past week, I have been in more than one conversation where the one I'm talking to is just in a place of despair. Despair about how is anything ever going to change. It just keeps happening. When can it ever change? How can it ever change? There's so much getting in the way. And that's the value of understanding what we mean when we say social holiness. Because social holiness isn't just about caring for the needs of the world. It's understanding that we cannot do this alone. We need each other. God created us to be a family together who are united by our love for God and our desire to be more Christ-like. But we cannot do that in the privacy of our own prayer closets. We need each other. We we need each other to, to encourage each other, to teach each other, to pray together, to read Scripture and learn from Scripture together, to listen to God together. We need each other. We need to learn from each other. And friends, we are better together. We had that t-shirt, those of you who were here three years ago, we had that t-shirt. People say to me, I want another one of those t-shirts. Maybe we'll pull those t-shirts back out again that say, we are better together. It's one of the things I've always loved about the United Methodist Church, that we as First United Methodist Church of Allen, we are not addressing what's going on in Allen on our own. For one thing, there are two other United Methodist churches in this area. The pastors are collaborating, but when what happened last week happened, I got so much prayer support from other churches all over this conference, praying for First United Methodist Church of Allen as we enter into this. We are better together. And we learn from each other. And we learn from our mothers in the faith. I've been thinking about that this weekend. About the mothers in the faith who have led me. My own mother, who 
went on to glory. It'll be uh, four years ago this summer, five years ago this summer. But other mothers in the faith, Sunday school teachers and Bible study leaders and mentors who, who taught me about what it means to be loved by God and how that compels me to engage with God's world. I thought about that yesterday when I read one of the lead stories in the Dallas Morning News. It's a story written by a reporter who I think went um, to the memorial that's over there at the entrance to the Allen Premium Outlets. And the reporter there encountered a volunteer who's been there all week. This volunteer is Cheryl Jackson. And Cheryl, on Monday, was on her way to visit her mother's grave and drove by and saw the memorial and immediately did a U-turn and pulled into the parking lot and went over to the gentleman who built the crosses and said, what can I do to help? And they handed her a paintbrush and she painted the crosses. And then she's gone and bought lumber and supplies and water and she's been there all week. And she has been the primary person sort of caring for the memorial, picking up trash. What, what she said is, we need to make sure this feels like everybody's living room. So she's been caring for the memorial. She's been caring for the flowers that are brought. She's been taking care of the stuffed animals. But even more than that, Cheryl has been there every day for the past week watching watching for someone who comes to the memorial in distress, weeping, bent over, and she goes to them and she opens up her arms and they fall in. And she cries with them and she holds their grief, she holds their pain. So when I read this article yesterday, I thought, I know Cheryl Jackson. And you may know who Cheryl Jackson is. This is Dr. Cheryl Jackson, who is the executive director of Minnie's Food Pantry in Plano, Texas. Minnie's Pantry was established in 2008 in honor and memory of uh, Dr. Jackson's mother, uh, Minnie, who was a Pentecostal preacher. Both Minnie and Cheryl's father were Pentecostal preachers. And one of the things Cheryl said is that my parents always told me to follow the crosses. And that's why she turned around on Monday, following the cross. Uh, Minnie was a Pentecostal preacher. She was a community activist in Plano, and she was mother to nine children. And she raised all nine of her children to be those who pay attention to what's going on in the community and the bring, bring the best of who they are to the community. Minnie was someone who knew what it was like to be hungry because as a child, she often went hungry. And she knew how powerful it was to feed hungry people, whether they were hungry in body or in spirit. And so Dr. Cheryl Jackson established the food pantry in memory of her mother, but I believe that Dr. Cheryl Jackson has also been working at and volunteering at that memorial all this week because of her mother and what her mother taught her about what it means to be more Christ-like in the world. Minnie's headstone says, loved God, loved neighbor. And she has certainly established that in her children. It is my prayer as a mom, as a pastor, as a member of the family that loves God and loves Jesus and seeks to be more Christ-like, that I and we will live into those two commands, knowing that we need both to love God, to pray, and to love neighbor and act. Glory to God. Amen.